वेलकम फ्रेंड्स टू दिस आफ्टरनून सेशन ऑफ द सेकंड डे फॉर थ्री डे इवेंट आई वाज टेकिंग अप सम क्वेश्चंस बिफोर वी ब्रोक ऑफ एंड सम क्वेश्चंस आर स्टिल लेफ्ट आई वाज टोल्ड देयर वर टू क्वेश्चंस लेफ्ट आई थिंक देयर मोर देन टू नाउ सो प्लीज लेट्स टेक अप दोस क्वेश्चंस I want to learn to use intuitive guidance for decision making. How do you experience an intuitive gut feeling? Is it different from an instant emotional reaction such as fear or dread? I read it again. I want to learn to use intuitive guidance for decision making how do you experience an intuitive gut feeling is it different from an instant emotional action reaction such as fear or dread you can't learn how to have intuition a friend of mine said he had learned how to use intuition as you give me an example we okay i want to know whether i will go east or west tomorrow now wait and see how i'll decide intuitively so he said ah uh, west <laughs> i said west is all right what was that ah uh, before that <laughs> thought intuition doesn't work like that intuition works differently because it comes by itself we are always getting that message this is the right thing to do it comes instantaneously no thought no time very often it is inconsistent with what the mind is saying so intuition is not practiced it's a natural faculty we have already so only we have to notice that it comes and we ignore it because we think too much if we start giving a proper role to thinking a thinking is to be used by us when needed not that thinking should be guiding us all the time which we are doing all the time let's say i have to decide something to do i will think how to do it i'll think about it as good use mind was made to be a useful instrument for us it's a very wonderful instrument if you use it if you allow it to become your master and tell you what to do it's terrible that's the difficulty with the mind so try to use your mind use your thought when you get a practice on using your mind where you need it where you have to think something use it when you don't have to use it ignore it it's an automatic circuit therefore it's automatically going on with some random thoughts anyway we begin to take random thoughts seriously no they have to be ignored that's just the mind functioning saying i am beating my heart mind is like heartbeat the heartbeat keeps the body alive blood flows and thinking keeps the mind alive mind will never stop thinking so that is why it will keep on thinking of bizarre things when i do my meditation workshops one of the exercise i do is to watch your mind without guiding it without telling it what to think see what it thinks and don't don't agree or disagree with what is it saying just watch what it thinks what it shows what pictures it makes most bizarre experiences people have because the mind is like that it just keeps on rolling keeps on bringing thoughts from memories from other things from associations from your attachments it keeps on bringing some thoughts continuously you don't need them you learn how to ignore the mind when you want to use it now put the thought that you like i want to do this thing i want to do that particular problem i have to solve use the mind if it thought is needed now when you practice ignoring the mind you will find that everything you want to decide intuitively decision will come to you automatically intuition works all the time but by our putting attention on the thoughts and mind we don't allow it to be noticed by us if you ignore the mind you will notice the intuition and act upon it now people give different i had a feeling i had a gut feeling this is happening i knew this is going to happen all retrospective 
all after the effect. Why not before the effect? If you were feeling like that, why didn't you act on it? Why are you regretting next day? So when you have the feeling, try to make that your decision. If your intuitive feeling is made your decision, and then you use the mind how to carry out the decision. This is putting the horse in front of the cart, not behind it. But when we allow the mind to think what it likes and take its advice, and intuition is cancelled by the mind's thinking, we don't use it. But there's a very big difference between intuition and an emotional reaction. All emotions arise from the lower centers. All people actually when they are in anxious, anxiety, fear, dread, heart palpitates. Some scare, something happened, congestion happened in the chest. The heart center, which is an energetic center, is responsible for most of our emotions. And the energy that is required to emotionally react comes from the heart center, not from the third eye center. Third eye center is very cool and calm. Heart center is violent, excited. Emotions come when there's excitement. And coolness comes when you are calm and meditation at third eye center. So therefore, fear and dread does not come from third eye center. It comes from the heart. We are afraid of so many things that is rightly said that our real fear is fear of the unknown. If we know what it is, if we are not afraid, then we have a concern how to handle it. If we feel something is dangerous for us, we handle it, we solve the problem by looking how to do it, how best to avoid it, how best to run away from it. But fear comes, what may happen? That might happen, this might happen. When we don't know what is going to happen, we are afraid. So fear is based on the unknown. We are not sure what will happen and we are afraid. Now, I had a seminar once with people who said we are all afraid of something or the other. And I said, write down the fear that you have. Every time you are afraid of something, write all the possible things that can happen. 90% time, none of those things happened, which they were afraid of. And if one thing happened, by being afraid of nine things, you are multiplying your fear nine times. It doesn't help. Fear has never helped anything. But fear is a natural emotional reaction to situations. If you meditate at the third eye center, gradually fear disappears. If you are able to reach just above the mind, you have no fear at all, ever. You become fearless. One of the great peripheral benefits of good meditation, that you can become fearless. Not only fearless, you can also become certain of everything. Not in doubt about all the time. Most of the fears are created by doubt. The mind is designed, programmed to create doubt. For a good reason. If we don't have doubts, we can be carried away by whatever anybody says. So skepticism or doubt or the need to verify is a natural good thing built into the mind and should be used. You have a doubt, clear the doubt, get more evidence, more, ev more facts to clear the doubt, worthwhile. But when you have higher knowledge, everything becomes clear by itself. And nothing can give greater clarity than deep meditation, I can tell you this. So when you have clarity and you see things exactly as they are, there is no doubt and therefore no fear. But when you are in doubt, you don't know what will happen, what can happen, then fear comes up. So ultimate solution is to build more of your presence at the third eye center, less in the emotional centers below these eyes and try to do as much meditation as possible to stay in the cool, calm atmosphere that arises here and you are able to handle everything with equanimity and calmness, which is possible by meditation. So meditation in the early stages of our spiritual path is very necessary. It helps in so many ways. We are at Third Eye Center and trying to visualize our Sadhguru. Will this divert our attention from self to Sadhguru? object, which is away from self.
we are at third eye center and trying to visualize our satguru will this divert our attention from self to satguru which is away from self no you are always at third eye center no matter where you direct your attention attention flows from third eye center when you are awake no matter where you put attention attention is going from third eye center attention is going from the self self is never diverted anywhere at any time attention can be diverted because attention is means to have experience all our experiences are born out of attention attention flows from the self conscious self attention goes automatically and with volition with your will attention goes automatically for example it goes from third eye center throughout this body and we know we have a body if attention is pulled away from the body we don't know if we have a body the reason why we know we have a body is our attention has scattered into the body once it's scattered in the body into sense perceptions our attention goes to what is whatever is around through the sense perceptions it all becomes alive if our attention were not there we don't see anything attention creates all experiences including the experience of your own body but attention flows from the self from third eye center when you put your attention on the satguru on the master you are still operating from the third eye center you are still operating from the self the self is using attention what the benefit of doing that is that the love of a satguru holds attention better then the attention other things hold so when you have meditation and put your attention on the satguru you are not moving away from the third eye center at all you are using third eye center to concentrate your attention on something that can hold and because the master is trying to take you inside you will notice that all your thinking about the master ultimately leads to your visualization and visualization brings ultimately the radiant form of the master inside not outside but we create a space in the three worlds physical world to experience anything we have to create a space between ourselves and something else we can't have experience without space similarly inside when we have radiant form of master or we put our attention we create an inner space an inner space has an inner sky and inner time inner time inner space don't always coincide with the time and space outside but the space is created so we may see a master sitting in front of us in meditation a space has been created but that's not outside space it's inside and that inside space holds our attention at the inside point and we are able to withdraw our attention from the physical presence outside so putting your attention on the satguru does not divert your self from the center it only concentrates your attention somewhere else it's still operating from third eye center we think that is why we are conscious or we are conscious that is why we think without knowledge how can we conscious i thought it was two years hmm? no. more than two now yes <laughs> we question is we think that is why we are conscious or we are conscious that is why we think without knowledge how can we be conscious consciousness precedes thinking precedes knowledge precedes being precedes even the awareness that you exist consciousness comes first consciousness is not what we think just to be able to see things or hear things or touch things these are sensory perceptions consciousness is life itself you can't be alive without consciousness so consciousness is the root it starts from there and consciousness can function by itself intuition comes directly from consciousness then we can use consciousness through the mind by thinking the mind is become alive because of consciousness and we use consciousness to make the mind alive and then we can think we are conscious therefore we can think we are not thinking therefore we become conscious we can't think without consciousness we can use consciousness through mind and sense perceptions to see touch taste smell 
using consciousness through mind and senses. We can use consciousness through the mind, senses and the physical body by walking about, I'm holding this paper, I'm reading it, all physical activity is being done by consciousness through the mind, through sense perceptions, through the body. So the order in which these things happen, consciousness first precedes everything. And without knowledge, how can we be conscious? Consciousness is which can pick up knowledge. No consciousness, no knowledge. So consciousness is the basis of all life. We Imagine if we are dead, everything is gone. So when we die at every level, nothing can function except consciousness is still alive. Consciousness is what creates the soul which is immortal. Other things are mortal. Even mind is mortal. Sense perceptions are mortal. And the physical body is mortal. They die. Consciousness never dies. Consciousness creates the self. Consciousness creates the experience of the self. So the very first thing is consciousness. That is what has been called the ultimate creative power. We think because there was no word for it, they called it the word. Shabd, nod, music, creative sound. Everything was called like that. That is why consciousness, when we approach it, the self when we approach it in meditation, can be accessed because of its presence and emanating sound. That's why sound is very important. It emanates its own sound. It is not a sound all the time. It's only sound when we are in the physical body. It changes, becomes different kind of sound later and becomes our identity. Beyond the mind, there is no sound because there is no space and time. That's not a sound as we define it, but we still call it sound because the same thing, which is our identity, our soul, is now becoming the self animating sound. That's why we call it the sound all the way through. But the consciousness is the most basic thing we have, and it all comes down to all experiences arising out of consciousness, including the acquisition of knowledge, including the memory that we acquire. It's all consciousness. My dearest Master, what is the reason that a person who earlier believed in you and had a lot of faith has recently started talking about you as an agent of negative forces, devil, who is trying to steal souls? What can be the reason that a person who earlier believed in you and had a lot of faith has recently started talking about you as an agent of negative forces, devil, who is trying to steal souls. I was very happy when Great Master stole my soul. <laughs> Some stealing it seemed to be good. The reason is simple. The mind is a negative entity sitting in us. Mind does not want to go inwards. Mind wants to go outward. If somebody develops a faith temporarily and tries to convince the mind, no, no, there is something in it, we'll get. And Masters gives incentives for that. Oh, it's wonderful, loving, blessed, all things is inside, go inside. Mind says, okay, for a moment it can be convinced. Then the mind feels it is being pulled away, the attention is being pulled away from the mind itself. It reacts and becomes a negative agent there and then. This can happen many times. That's how doubts are created. People have faith. Everything is going fine. And you ask those people, how did your faith come in your master? Everything went well. My life changed. I didn't have a job. I got a job. I didn't have a proper place to live. I got a house. I got this thing. I, everything went very well. I said, very good. And one day, my son died in an accident. How can there be a master? How could he not save my son? He is no master. Ninety-nine things happened wonderful. And one happened the mind doesn't accept as a good thing. Therefore, all ninety-nine are washed away. That's how the mind functions. The mind does not take the whole thing that this is a whole picture of ups and downs we are here in a roller coaster. Human life is a roller coaster. Supposing it was not a roller coaster. Supposing all our karma was good, 
we wouldn't be here. He'd be in heaven. There are wonderful places to be in if all karma is good. Supposing all our karma was bad, we wouldn't be here. We'd be in hell. There are places already existing in the astral plane, sub-astral plane, overlap of the plane. They exist. If everything is bad, we go there. If everything is good, we go somewhere else. Not here. We come into human life on physical plane when we have a mixture of good and bad karma. I have to understand this. It's the very nature of creation. So that is why everybody's life has ups and downs. I have not met a person who says, all my life was great glory, has ups and downs. Or all the life was miserable and never had a good time. But there are two types of factors which make this life ups and downs. Some are visible, like richness, poverty, good health, bad health. These are easily seen differences that some, are, some look good, some look bad. There are others which are intangible. For example, the richest people I have met, multi-millionaires, billionaires, whom we see on the movie screen and we get, say, wow, they must be very happy. They are the most unhappy people I have met. They have been compensated one way, that externally they have a lot of wealth, internally they have no happiness because their problem is their emotions with the people. They have had divorce after divorce, they can't find a suitable partner, they can't trust anybody, they are afraid of the press, they are running from them, they are sick, insecure. The insecurity is killing them and no amount of money can take away their insecurity. Actually, I did a little course at Harvard University because I used to bother and tease my economics professor. Economics professor was teaching us that if something you keep on having, they're diminishing returns. I said, does it also apply to love? Love? I haven't studied that part. In economics, we don't study love. I said, but love is part of life. If something is applicable, you are making universal declarations, you should study love, you study the diminishes or increases with time. So then I asked for a course to be done to see what makes people happy and unhappy as economics course. I wrote an economics paper on that. He gave me the permission. So I took out the telephone book of the greater Boston area and I picked out randomly 1,000 names. And I sent out a questionnaire which I prepared. It's a very simple questionnaire. What makes you happy? Please list the reasons why, what makes you happy. On the other side of the page, write the list of things that make you unhappy. It was a simple question. Almost all the answers were very similar. If we have a lot of money, if we have a good house, a good car, good family, good children, we have all these good things, we are happy. Reverse, if we are poor, don't have any of these things, we have <coughs> naughty children, we have an unfaithful wife, then we are unhappy. Same kind of reason most people gave. I said one of the reasons they gave, if we have money, we are happy. Let's examine that. There was an ex-professor of Harvard University who had gone back to business. This was common in Harvard Business School that many faculty members were from business. They would come, serve on the university and go back to business. This man had been a faculty member in the business school and now was running a big business and his known assets, publicly known assets, were over $10 million. I said, he's rich. By those standards, he's rich. So I asked him for interview. I interviewed him in his office. I said, you have written, let's take only one item, money. You said money makes one happy. You have a lot of money, are you happy? He said, not at all. I said, why did you write this? He said, I gave a general answer. It doesn't apply to me. I said, why doesn't it apply to you? He says, I'll tell you why. I went to the same school where you are studying. I went to Harvard Business School. I spent years studying. I graduated. I got a doctoral, uh, doctoral thesis, doctoral degree. I'm a doctor from that university. Spent my whole life studying to become a successful businessman. And that is why I made my 10 million. And look at that bloke next door to me. 
never went to any college and he has 20 million how can i be happy <laughs> he had transferred his happiness to his neighbor i'm just giving you one example i'm telling you that now how could you discover his unhappiness he is happy because he got money but he is unhappy because the neighbor has more these intangible things are many and there are a lot of them are emotional sides which are hidden people can't see them and when you study their lives you find if you were to give some weightage to the tangible things and weightage to the intangible things and study the human race as a whole you'll be surprised that they are very well balanced they are all equal in one way or the other one has got more of this less of this more of that less of this is a very interesting fact that this is the roller coaster has been set up for human life and we all have some highs and some lows sometimes we think they must be high all the time they are not so it's just by study of human being that we discover so in this kind of life our relationship start with the mind even with the master we have to convince ourselves why do masters become teachers they don't need to they have to they have come to love, love us pick us up take us home why should they teach meditation because our mind wants it why do they work hard do merit more meditation why mind wants it mind says you can't get anything without effort and in, internally also we must have lot of effort put in and it cannot recognize that the pull of love can be stronger than effort mind never accepts it intuition accepts it mind does not so therefore they become teachers they become friends they become like us they encourage us like ordinary beings for our minds and when one bad thing happens in life we forget the good because that's what the mind is and we can lose faith but masters have a way of dealing with that also they also know our spiritual journey has the same ups and downs like the rest of life even meditation people who meditate regularly they know some days meditation is very good they feel very high next day you can't meditate you can't concentrate your attention at all so there is a sine curve up and down that runs life and also runs our spiritual growth in spirituality we also go like that in terms of happiness we also go up and down is one difference if you are on a spiritual path and practicing your meditation the axis there is an axis on which the ups and downs go it's called a sine curve because it goes up and then goes down below the axis comes up above the axis goes down below the axis even when you are very successful in meditation the ups and downs still go but the axis gets shifted up like this so the better is better than the previous better the worse is less worse than the previous worse that's how it works so that you can notice actually in meditation you will notice that the axis will also op operate with the higher lifted axis and your normal life will also follow that pattern that you will get more happiness than previous high happiness and less bad times than the previous bad times so this is just a control but the world is made with ups and downs that is why we are here it's very lucky that we are here i should we should not say that why not be in heaven then in heaven you have no free will in hell you have no free will in astral plane you have no free will in causal plane you have no free will in in the form of a dog or a cat no free will form of a tree or a plant or an insect no free will birds no free will just running according to a program through instincts that's how all life runs instinctively everything is programmed it is amazing i have the a video of a fish it's a japanese fish on the in the japanese shallow sea uh, the shallow sea they have sand lot of sand this fish with its fins works on that and makes different patterns 
and some uh, photographers took underground cameras and watched the fish working for seven days. In seven days, the fish created perfect circles, perfect designs, and you'll be amazed at with the perfection which are created. A fish has no brains, fish couldn't see anything from the top like we could see. She had to design that. When I was young, I studied beehives, the bees bake. In a beehive, they make small little apertures. That's how the hive is made. Each one is octagonal, eight sides. As you may or may not know, each side is equal to the fourth degree of a centimeter. And they have no measuring tools. And how do the bees make them? How the drones make them? The bees have in the hive only one queen bee and thousands of drones. The whole, the bigger the hive, the more drones. Queen is only one. Queen is in the center. Queen bee, if you watch, I spend a lot of time with the, watching the hives working. The queen bee is in the center. You can always know where the queen bee is because no drone is facing its back to the queen. We, we don't learn that respect for a queen like the bees have learned. And when they have to move in the hive, the bees, the drones withdraw before they fly off. They never turn around and fly. They give so much respect to the queen. Never went to school or college to learn these things. These bees, look at other animals. How they are programmed to do these things, very skillful things. Birds are flying in the sky. You must have sometime noticed that the bird fly making like two wings, two wings at an angle. And the leading bird is flying, followed by the other bird in two wings. The distance of these next birds are exactly correct to be pushed by the vacuum created by the top one. Each one is getting the benefit, the push. You might also have noticed that out of the two wings in which the bird fly, one is longer than the other. There are two or three or four birds extra in one line. And these bird watchers have found out. What are they for? Why is one line longer? It is when one of the birds, any bird, falls sick and falls to the ground or on a tree, the one at the end, they are the rescue birds, they come down to help them. The remaining ones keep on. Who gave them that intelligence? Which books did they study to do all that? All life forms, from bacteria to angels and gods who might be created and running the universes. No free will, only program. Out of 8.4 million species of life forms, only one has been given what is called free will, the choice to make amongst alternative options, human being. And because of this, ups and downs are there so we can make a choice. If all was one way, we wouldn't make a choice. Therefore, the choices that we make bring in us something that we can make a choice with our mind. We can choose, make a choice with our hands. We can make a choice with our soul. Seeking the truth is a choice made by the soul. This choice making would not be there if we didn't have the experience of free will. Question asked is, is free will real? If it is real, there's a little problem there. Because we think we all worship God and God knows everything. If we have free will, God doesn't know anything. Because if he knows what we are going to decide, it's not free will. If he already knows, God already knows what we are going to decide, he have no free will. Then if there is no free will, why law of karma? Why should we be punished and rewarded if there is no free will, real free will? It only looks like free will. The, this is a very significant point on the spiritual path. Without the experience of free will, we would not be seekers and have experience of seeking. The whole thing is pre-planned, pre-written, predetermined, but it has to experience as if it is happening with free will now. How has it been created? Very simple. Make you ignorant of the future, free will comes. Tomorrow you know your future, if you know you are five minutes ahead, you lose your free will. You will know what will happen. 
and that's what happens in the astral and causal planes. You know exactly what's going to happen. Somebody asked me, is it true that in the astral plane, if we really meditate hard and put our attention and forget this world, we can see tomorrow? I said, yes, you can do. He said, I'm going to try tonight because tomorrow lottery is coming. I'll be able to see the number. Which number is going to win? And I buy that ticket and I put that number. So he went in and he was very keen and he said, nothing more I want to see, just the number of the winning lottery tomorrow. And tomorrow was shown up and he saw the number of the winning lottery. And he got out of meditation. Already the number is forgotten. I, I knew it, I saw it, I can't remember. I remember there were three, three and six were there, I remember. Next day lottery came, three and six were there. Other number, he said, I remember, this is what I saw. Too late. Why did this happen? If he had already seen it, because the memory that is held at that level is different from the memory we hold here. You cannot transfer that experience in total here, but you can partially. Little bit of it can be carried forward. Just like the dream sequences, they disappear when we wake up. Similarly, these experiences come back to the reality when we make the physical reality, and that becomes something we have seen maybe dreamlike. Some people are very unsure if they have astral experiences or if they have dreams. They ask me, what's a dream or is it a relaxed experience? Because even astral experiences, when you come back into physical body, look like a dream. Because this is our reality, then that becomes unreal. When you are there, that's real. When you come back to this body to examine what you had earlier, that looks like a dream. So the signs of an astral experience and the physical, to remember what you can remember the physical, some very strong experiences in the astral plane we retain here. And we can't forget. Supposing we find in the astral plane that we are a very different person and we're living somewhere very far, which we have no idea now. It, it had a big impact on us in the meditation, the astral plane, and we come back to physical, we may remember that part. Or some, just like a dream, we have a traumatic dream and we remember some part of a traumatic dream. And some parts, which are good parts, in the dreams, they look so real that even when you wake up, you are feeling sorry why you woken up. It had happened with me. I bought a lottery ticket in a dream and I won $5 billion. They said cash or check. I said cash. I want to see what $5 million looks like. So they gathered all the cash and as they were going to hand over, I woke up. I tried very hard to go back to sleep. I said, at least let me collect it, then I can wake up. Now, at this time it looked silly. At that time it looked like a good decision. At least see it once. The dreams at the lower level of consciousness of wakeful state are generally in monocolor. Color of the skin, flesh colored, dark or light. Most of them are very monocolor. Or they have more colors of the red side of the spectrum. And they have some orange, but rarely blue. When somebody has a dream of a blue sky, see clearly, a yellow flower growing in a blue sky, it could very well be an astral experience. We have these experiences all the time. So certain colors occur in the experiences we have because we can go into an astral state. If we are meditating regularly, we go regularly into the state, but when we come back, we can't distinguish was it a dream or was it real. I'm telling for those people, who can't determine that there's a very big difference in the colors that appear. And somehow uh, you will understand this better when you find in the causal plane, the colors are created there and play a very important role in the creation of objects and experiences in lower levels. And colors have personality and color can take on a soul. 
That means colors of personality there, like we have personalities here in the causal plane. It's a very different kind of experience. So those are, they manifest very differently at different levels. So mostly if they are very bright colors or they are colors which are unusual, we have never seen them here. They generally belong to the astral plane. I did an exercise with you and I said, imagine that you have flowers. And many of you, many of you saw flowers which you had never seen in this world at all. You were not trying to imagine those flowers because then you would have seen. What you tried to imagine was replaced by something that was different. I sometimes, at the end of a program, give an offer with my great master's permission. I give an offer that if you want to use your astral body right now to pick up an astral gift, great master will place those gifts on top of the roof and you go and pick it up with your astral body, not with the physical. And all you have to do is to imagine that you're going up and people go up and they pick up many of them. In fact, more than half of the people actually pick up gifts. And those gifts are totally different from what they can imagine. But many of them imagine those things like crystals selling out light or things, flowers emitting colorful lights, which don't exist here at all. How do they get those? They're all astral gifts. Astral is not somewhere else. It's right where we are. Everything is right where we are. It's a complete overlap. We are just moving our attention from one type of experience to another type. We don't have to go anywhere to go to another plane. The plane is here and we can slip into it, especially when we are doing meditation regularly. We can slip into people have had glimpses of the soul. People have had glimpses of the causal plane. Very short glimpse while they were medit in the beginning of meditation. So, and very often, masters give that kind of the sampling. People come to the master, and they get a very good ice clips, and then they can't get it. I remember, this is a colleague of mine, friend of mine, I worked in business with him. And when I came in the beginning, I attended some seminars where they invited me, called Spiritual Frontier Fellowship, or some names like that, I, they invited me and I would go and give some talks or hold some seminars. And one of the person who became my colleague later, he said, can't we just have one glimpse of what the world looks like from heaven? I said, of course one can. I request great master, give him a glimpse. What's the big deal? And he sat in some meditation and he felt he flew away and he saw the earth planet and he saw the buildings, he saw everything and he came and said, this is so easy. I said, yes, it is easy. It's a matter of putting attention somewhere. Okay, I, I can do it any time. For 20 years he's been begging, let me have that again. <laughs> what happened? It was just a glimpse given out of grace, given, but the usefulness of that glimpse is you are firmly established there is something more than what we can see here. And that's the benefit. It's a big benefit that you come to know there is something else. And I saw it myself. I know it's hard to get. I don't know this struggle is not giving me, but I know there's something that establishes a certain element of faith which does not go away easily because it's experiential. It's your own experience. It's not based on somebody else telling you what to believe. So that is why these kind of things happen. In many cases, masters do that. And it's a good thing. But to know that you can be in an astral plane and have an astral, the colors can be a good indication. And things that are not existing here, you can see them in astral plane, but they are more attractive. They are slightly different from what you see here. And if you do practice regularly, then you, by on volition, on your own, you can become uh, there. You can go there by withdrawing attention at any time.
it's best to to do enough meditation even if you have to do lot med- more meditation i remember when i had doubts about meditation and effectiveness i did try for a very long period 8 hours at sometimes at a stretch but i then they don't find that it is not the meditation itself there has to be something else pulling us besides the meditation and then i found out what it is called grace grace of the master so both work together and in the beginning when you are trying hard the master knows that this is the time your mind has to work hard it has to convince itself that there is something and makes you work hard and when you work hard it is its grace also flowing which gives you those experiences so in the beginning you have to have that but once the experience comes it is like faith building experience and then it sticks with you many other doubts can come up about life and why this bad thing happened why not good things happen all good things happen i have got a master all questions keep on coming but then you find with more meditation with more grace what is the role of effort and grace this question has been asked many times in the beginning effort is everything because you can't see grace at all as you move on you find your effort is not yielding what is otherwise coming to you and you say that's grace i couldn't do it i tried it didn't do it but now it's working more grace then more and more grace less and less effort at the end all grace no effort and then you look back and say in the beginning was effort and now it is all grace you discover it was all grace right from the beginning it was grace that you got the, te- the desire to have make effort it was grace that made you do meditation it was grace all the time it looked like effort to start with and become pure grace without effort at the end it still all grace this is a very big role that the perfect living masters perform for their disciples they have to take them back home no matter what so these are some of the experiences we go through on the journey back to our true home which is all within ourselves we just opening up the doors and finding out what is there i must go back to the question in my hand <laughs> this was about person losing faith after having faith and explained it to you any more questions in great masters and other saints discourses there is a mention of two two faculties of soul surat <coughs> and nirvana Please, can you talk a little about it? And if we only hear sounds and inner experiences that don't see anything, does that limit our spiritual growth? In great masters and other saints' discourses, there is a mention of two faculties of the soul surat and nirat please can you talk a little about it that the first question second if we only hear sound in inner experiences but don't see anything does that limit our spiritual growth first question about surat and nirat surat means attention that is why this path has been called surat shabd yoga put your attention on the sound and get union with your true self that is the meaning of surat shabd yoga surat to start with to discover the self is done by listening to the sound therefore surat can be used as putting attention on listening nirat is viewing seeing these two faculties they continue for a long time with us they change their nature but they are always there other senses are dropped for example sense of touch touch smell so on we drop them but hearing and seeing they go on for a long time the hearing and seeing in the spiritual regions is very different from hearing and and seeing over here because we don't have these kind of eyes we don't have these there the hearing and seeing 
virtually merge in the soul and become knowing, true knowing. Intuition comes from that true knowing, flows from the soul, from that true knowing. But below that, all the time, we from the mind, we start separating it into listening and seeing. So, in meditation, when we do, there are two things happening, visual, visual things and audio things. So, audio-visual things are happening all the time. On audio, because of the importance of the sound coming from the self, and, and video, because we are seeing things happen, because the creation of this space-time in this physical world, in the astral world, in the causal world, is in a space. So the visual experiences are always there. So visual and audio experiences have a great role to play. So Surat and Nirat both play a role. Hearing and seeing both play a role in this. Sometimes in meditation, some people see more, hear less. They can see things that are not here in the world. And they say, we know we have gone somewhere else. Hear nothing. Some hear the sounds, but see nothing. It looks like they are missing something. They are not missing. Because Surta Nirta becomes one in Parbaram, and that is why when it separates, the nature of it still remains the same. And that is why somebody can emphasize, and I will explain to you why that emphasis takes place, emphasize on visual, and sees more, hears less. And some have the other audio things more. Why this happens? It happens because of past lives. And there, are, there is a thing called karma, and there is something called sanskar. You might have heard of this. Karma is an event that happened. Sanskar is an attitude created from that event. Karmas change. You hit somebody, they hit you back, karma over. But the attitude created by that goes on. And these attitudes are lasting for a long time, so sanskar don't change very easily, karma can change. So that is why the attitudes we have towards dealing with something are the same. You'll see that the style and attitude of people in every walk of life, in everything, including meditation, is the same, consistent. Another person has a different style. So this is what carries on. A person who has been blind, or not blind for birth, but blinded during a past life, will have a great attachment to seeing and will have a very strong nirat over here and less surat. A person who is deaf has a hard time listening as a karmic event of the past will have a different leaning towards listening or seeing. These bulk of these last karmas from several lifetimes in not one lifetime. Such cars are created by several lifetimes put together. And when they work, they create our leanings towards one or the other. That is why some people in the beginning can see one more than the other. Some get spectacle they can see easily and not hear anything. Some can, some can hear the sound very well and they can be pulled by the sound. But Nirat opens up later. It's a normal thing based on our past karma. The truth is, there is no difference between the two, which we discover much later. All sense perceptions arising from a total perception, mind can have total perception in the causal plane. But these two, which persist, actually combine completely just above the mind. I don't know how many of you have studied this uh, process of opening up more levels, but the levels are described very nicely this is the physical level. What is the characteristic of this physical level? Just physical matter. That's the characteristic. If there is no matter, it's not physical. If it's energy only, it would not be called a physical reality, though it's part of the physical world. Energy and matter, they used to say, are equal. Sometimes matter becomes energy, energy becomes matter, but they are all the same. Total is the same. Now they are doubting that because the balance has not come out from radioactive waves and therefore now they found dark matter, dark energy, many percentages. So that is why they are revising all their opinions. They have to revise many opinions when they discover more. 
सो दिस बिजनेस ऑफ मैटर क्रिएट्स फिजिकल यूनिवर्स इन साइंस वी स्टडी इन साइंस हाउ द आइंस्टीनियन थियरीज ऑफ रिलेटिविटी फाउंड आउट सम वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग फैक्ट्स दैट यू कैन कन्वर्ट वन इन टू द अदर मैटर कैन बी कन्वर्ट टू एनर्जी दैट वॉज एटम बॉम्ब वॉज मेड आउट ऑफ दैट डिस्कवरी बाई आइंस्टाइन very destructive thing we can also redo and make energy into matter but with much greater effort then they found and this is something very more recent called quantum physics quantum mechanics in quantum mechanics they said that if there is a wave it will be an energy and not a matter matter made of atoms or particles if you put your observation a human observation on a wave it can become matter we you to think you need lot of power to convert energy into matter now they found out human observation changes a wave into matter that is the quantum physics and how they found out because i don't know how many of you are interested in this subject but i'm just mentioning because i had lot of interest in discovering these things there is a hydrogen atom the very first atom that was created after what they say was a big bang and the world was created the whole universe was created and hydrogen was the first because most elemental it's got only one small nucleus and one electron moving around it now today we can measure take picture of an atom it is a picture of a hydrogen atom with that such microscopes we have such telescopes we have which can see billions of light years away what has happened by these instruments when we see one electron moving in an orbit around its nucleus creating the gas called hydrogen we know the distance of the electron from the nucleus that's the radius we know its orbit but orbit can be like this orbit can be like this it can be like this you can make million combinations of the orbit which orbit is it that one electron so they can now put a laser beam as thin as a photon or as thin as electron and the laser beam touches any point on the orbit any point electron is there after that electron is only in that orbit nowhere else you can take any orbit and put the laser beam the right distance oh, electron is there after that is only there before that it is all over what did we do what did human intervention maybe through laser beam or observation or the eyes what did we do we created matter out of energy this is a very big thing they are going to use this principle called the quantum physics principle quantum mechanics principle in designing new computers some have already been designed as prototypes called quantum computers what will a quantum computer do it can based on your thought and observation change a zero into one and a one into zero the very digital language we are using for all digital phenomena and all digital experiences you have program one thing your mind think different it will change the program for your observation they making such computers this this is all being tied up with a new science they called ai artificial intelligence they are putting artificial intelligence into machines and they have demonstrated i don't know if you have seen uh, there is a baby doll looking like a human woman called sophia or some name like that they given and put lot of intelligence into the chips in the brain the head of the doll and doll gives answers like a human being they demonstrated this doll in saudi arabia and the saudi arabian government has granted citizenship citizenship to the doll <laughs> it's an actual fact just happened and not only that 
they say if you make more such dolls they will all be our citizens other countries are thinking we might like to adopt some too the beginning another uh, person has just designed he said why to make such a huge huge human face he made a small doll this size and put the same intelligence little doll in his hand and you can ask any question doll answer very intelligently it is all possible answers intelligently designed to give to you we have our intelligence as human beings only of one individual they can put 1000 intelligent people's intelligence into one artificial doll it will be the most intelligent more intelligent than anyone here now the fear is being expressed that one day we will become slaves of these robots these robots will be more intelligent they will know what to do because that doll which has been granted saudi arabian citizenship was interviewed in london and elsewhere and one question one asked person asked do you think you can also in your own intelligence destroy human kind and she said yes i can destroy also as a danger point so the very same intelligence we fed into the machine it can say that therefore they say there is a danger that we might all become slaves and be wiped out if they want to run the whole planet by dolls where are we heading for these are batters when we say technology it's a great human experience going on here i can tell you fortunately some of you are young some you know don't worry they won't destroy us the ones who are sitting here <laughs> so we are safe which generations may have to handle this themselves i talked about surat and nirat this can be built into dolls also and the second one is if we only hear the sound with no visual experience are we slow in our progress no it just how leaning our sanskar is making the sound more audible therefore we are still making progress at the right time the the nirat will also open up and the surat will also work at the same time sorry for straying away so much from the main question and giving you some other information any more questions do i have time i wear a nice watch which is always black 405 another question one question you say there are multiple planets on which living beings like us or more advanced are present have you personally experienced it in your meditation are there perfect living masters there too describe one or two such places you say there are multiple planets on which living beings like us or more advanced are present have you personally experienced it in your meditation are there perfect living masters there too describe one or two such places okay i am not supposed to des- describe my inner experiences but i can ex- uh, describe two experiences that were given to me as glimpses by great master so i can't say what i have been to through meditation but i can show share with you two glimpses that were given to me by great master when i was very young one was out of curiosity i had i hadn't had any much progress inside i was just curious i asked great master is the future of this planet already written up because there were lot of societies growing up around me and outside of the other countries saying save the planet save the planet that this planet is in danger and we must save it that we are polluting it we are contaminating it and floods are coming and nuclear warfare can destroy everything all kinds of negative thoughts were coming about this planet and groups have been going around saying save the planet so i asked great master can you just please give me one glimpse of the year 4000 ad on this planet is it okay you can see not a big deal and i saw this planet abandoned no living 
being on this planet. All living beings of the planet are now hovering around in artificial satellites around this planet. The satellites of the planet. They all are living there. Their communication is very highly advanced. Knowledge is injected into the heads, not learnt in a school or college. I had over I to overhear conversations. It was a very short experience. I had con overheard conversations how they were looking at the planet and saying what foolish primitive this human race was that they built roads. Who needed roads? They spent money and resources on building roads, on building universities and big buildings like this. Did they know that this is all useless stuff? That knowledge can be shared just by putting one extra chip in the brain? Everybody knowledge can be gathered together in one chip and place. We are all equally knowledgeable. They, did they have no idea? That's what they thought about us. Like we think about the cavemen. We think cavemen put three stones together, took one away. I know it's one less. And it would like as much excitement as a computer software man makes the new software today. That's how they think about us. A very strange feeling. They throw the artificial birth, artificial growing up and deaths taking place at certain pre-programmed programs and dumping of bodies on the graveyard called planet Earth. I was very surprised to see all that. So that was just a glimpse. Now, I'm not saying this for the first time. I said the same thing 20 years ago. I said the same thing 40 years ago. This glimpse of mine I'm sharing with you. Second glimpse, which will answer more of this question, is, is there life on other planets? We don't know. There is a certain law called the law of probability in mathematics. Law of averages, law of probability is a mathematical law, but it proves itself right all the time. It's very strange. If you have a coin and toss it, if it is really equally balanced, it can come either heads or tails. If you toss it ten times, it may come to heads ten times, tail zero, or maybe tails ten times, zero. If you toss it hundred times, it won't be hundred heads or hundred tails. It will become close, move to 60, 40, 70, 30, something like that. If you do it a thousand times, it will come closer to that. If you toss a coin a million times, it will be half million heads, half million. Does it have a head? Does it have intelligence? How does it determine which one to show up? And in large numbers, it shows up half and half. This is because of the mathematical law of law of probability. It's probably going to show this. When it shows heads too many times, the probability of it showing tails increases. Because probability says both have equal chance. If one has come more, other one will balance it. According to this law of probability, and the study of the universe that we have today. The law of probability says there should be 28,000 planets exactly like the planet Earth on which life should be exactly like ours. This is based on law of probability. But this law of probability was expounded many times earlier. Nobody could calculate because we didn't know so many, so many galaxies exist. Now we have traced billions of galaxies all around. But recently, they started looking at planets like ours, which are called exoplanets. They're looking at exoplanets and they're finding essential thing, water should be on them to the life like our life. Our life is mostly built with water. Our body is mostly water. Plants are water. Most of the things are water. The surface of the earth is seven eighths water. Most of it is water. Underneath is all water. So they are thinking if we can find planets with water, likelihood is, is life. 
But long before all this happened, I asked great master one day, does life exist elsewhere in this universe? He said, yes. I said, one place or many? He said, several. There are several worlds. And they are physical, astral or even more in the astral space. I said, can you? Same curiosity. Show me one. <laughs> Just for a few seconds, please. Great Master laughed. He said, sit with me. And I sat with him. And he showed me one planet. Several light years away. You can never go by physical means. You can go internally. Through meditation, any one of you can go and see these things. It's not something unique, I'm telling. The capacity, the potential to see these things is in all of you. It's not something that I'm saying only I can see it or some great master could only show. All of you can see through meditation at the astral plane. You can fly at top speed, go anywhere in the created universe, in the overlap, it's all same universe, physical and astral together. Anyway, what did I see there? Most essential feature I saw was that they have developed, they look similar but not exactly like us. And big population, I went only to a small section of it and saw that they have a gadget they carry, a very small gadget by which they control time. They can advance it and they go ahead in time. They can retard it and they go back in time, which is very strange for us. That means a person sitting to you can say, let me visit tomorrow for a day. Let me visit tomorrow for five minutes. It disappears. He is seeing what he we, I will see tomorrow. He is seeing it now. And he can come back and talk to me. I, I couldn't understand. I had to ask great master about this phenomenon. That here, why can't we do this in the physical plane? If space and time are one continuum, according to science, according to Einstein, space-time is one continuum. Time is only an ordinate of space. Three ordinates of space and time is the fourth ordinate of space. We can go on space and come back. Why can't we go in time and come back? It should be the same principle. It's a big anomaly. Science has recognized this anomaly. They're trying to find out why is it not possible for us to move in time the way we move in space. Great Master explained something to me. They have controlled this. That it works equally well in space. Somebody can go forward and come back and tell me. Or go backwards. Time they can go forward and come back. This I had never seen, never imagined. But this is a normal thing for them. They don't think it's a miracle. They think it's normal. It's one of the planets. One feature I've told you. You wanted to know what a feature. I've told you that feature. Great Master's explanation, which suits my logic, is that when the events were placed on time-space, in the causal plane, they were all placed together. They were not designed to come one after the other. Time was created and is absolutely stationary. All fixed already. Events are placed all there. We are time traveling even now. And if we can change the space of our time travel, we can do exactly what the people in the other planet are doing. And this will be done even on this planet later on. So this is, uh, these are some of the things if you are very curious like I was, you will explore many things. It's a great joy to be able to go where you can't go physically and to be able to go with an inner self which can fly at top speed. It doesn't have any matter, no gravity to pull it down, and yet all perceptions are very strong and intact. You can see better, hear better, touch better, everything is better, and yet no matter in it. Try it out. Very easy. Put your attention on your own self behind the eyes at the third eye center. Become unaware first of what is happening around you, 
Secondly, what's happening to you? What's happening to your body? Just be aware of what's happening here, inside. And you'll open up and see the other world where you can fly. Thank you very much for joining me. And I'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock.